They still get up and chase the car. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is faithful all the way to the end. Can you lower this just a little? Thank you. Praise be to God. You know, one of the things that the Lord does when we become believers, if we're truly believers. See, there's a lot of people that say they believe, but they don't follow. They just play religion. No reality of that there's a war going on, and they're called from darkness into light. And in, in that deception, but to those who are truly believers, they seek the Lord. They want to know Him. They want to learn more. There's a thirst and hunger in their heart. When you are born again of the Spirit, you have a thirst and hunger. Or you're not born again. You're just religious. Telling everybody you're a Christian, but you're really not. Because to be a Christian, that means, means Christ-like. It means you want to be like Him. Amen. And in that, when we become born again in the Spirit, one of the things the Lord does is he, he puts us around areas, not only, He keeps us accountable. You know, just like a young child and whatever, and uh, still immature of things. And immature doesn't mean stupid. Amen? It means that God is growing. So there are things that somebody might know more than what you might know. And there's always somebody that knows more than everybody else. Amen? Knowledge is an area to where it can be used as a weapon. God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But the knowledge is not of this world. It's from the unseen world, the eternal world, the eternal realm. So we gain knowledge to use for discernment. You know, discernment is essential. And one of the things the Lord does is He puts boundaries on us. There's boundaries. They're like invisible fences. And you get quickened when you, there's a, a, a conviction, there's a quickening when you begin to get too close to them, knowing that their God has set a boundary for you so that you don't go over them. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He sets boundaries in our life. And these boundaries start off close. And as we earn his trust and learn more, these boundaries begin to expand more. Eventually, the boundaries are opened because now you're being led by him and his voice and not by the boundaries. Does everybody understand? So there's a process of growing and maturing. And there's areas when we make mistakes, he resets the boundaries again. Why? He's wanting to protect us. Everything is about protection. Everything is about learning. If you're not willing to learn, you end up burning and getting burned. Amen? So in this area to where God is bringing us to, especially where we are right now in this time and season, we are going to see more demonic areas. You're going to see more people fall away, but you're going to see a huge harvest. You're going to see many people fall back to the old way of living because they refuse to assemble or be consistent. They still want to live their life. They're still in justification. In this, one of the things about boundaries, when God sets them up, they're also known as divine restraints. They're divine restraints. And so in submitting to the divine restraints of God, you are set in a place where you're able to receive counsel, correction, and direction. Because everything is in a divine order. Amen? God always sets things in divine order. When things are out of order, it's chaos. That's where many people fall into confusion because their life is not in divine order. There are certain priorities that it shouldn't be. Amen? There's wrong priorities, let's say. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, divine restraints. First Corinthians chapter 2.
Hallelujah. Is everybody there? I'll start at verse 1. Let's speak it. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with what? Excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of humans' wisdom, but in what? Demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know, again, there's an area where people fall into the wisdom of men and walk away from the power of God. There's many people who, who trust their doctors and medication and all the other stuff more than they do God. They don't, in other words, God's not first. People go to college and learn things and so forth, and that wisdom that is being released to them, they trust more in that wisdom than they do God. See, because there's a wisdom from above and there's a wisdom from beneath. And in this, yes, we need wisdom, but we need it from above. And this is where many people fall into that area with no restraints. Because pride comes by wisdom from men. Humility comes by wisdom from God. There's a difference. Because that's where the fear of the Lord comes. Reverence, honor, and respect. Let's go a little further. Verse 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age nor the rulers of this age who are coming to what? Nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a what? Mystery. It's hidden. In other words, it must be searched out. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for whose glory? Our glory. Which none of the rulers of this age knew, for if they had known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who what? Who love him. So how many of y'all know that there are a lot of things God has prepared for you? The problem is, is you may be waiting on these things, but God is saying search them out. Verse 10, it tells you here, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except for the what? Spirit of God. <laughs> so many people are being misled by wisdom and technology of man. But they're not connected to the power of God. See, one of the things the enemy is always trying to do is get us disconnected to the power of God. And what we're supposed to do is get disconnected from the world and get reconnected to the power of God. Amen? So you've got to be careful because one of the things that the enemy is doing right now, not only through technology and music and all kinds of other stuff, but he is really dumbing down. Dumbing down people. People are beginning to exchange their thirst and hunger for God's presence. For fulfillment of the wisdom of men. Does everybody understand? It is happening big time all over. They're exchanging the presence of God for lust. They're exchanging the presence of God for the presence of evil. That's the bottom line. People are going out who used to be free from drugs and alcohol and bound again. So what's happened now is the restraints they used to hold have been dismantled. The divine restraints have been removed because of rebellion and disobedience. Now the restraints of the evil comes. That's called bondage. That's called what? Bondage. Remember, the Lord released the Israelites out of Egypt. He called the house of bondage. Well, what was in Egypt? It was like Sodom and Gomorrah. It was whatever you wanted to do. Do what thou feel like. 
which is we know as Satan's doctrine. Amen? In Acts chapter 1. So only those born of the Spirit of God will receive revelation from God. Those born of the flesh will receive revelation from man's wisdom. Amen? Acts chapter 1. Hallelujah. In verse 4. Acts 1 verse 4. Let's speak it together. And being assembled together with them, Jesus, he did what? He commanded. He did what? He commanded. Hallelujah. If God shows up and commands you to do something, you're going to say no? You have to be an idiot. <laughs> he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall receive the bapt you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they heard when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? But Jesus wasn't talking about the kingdom of Israel. He was talking about the kingdom of God. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive what? Power. You shall receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. The Holy Spirit is not only the connector to the river of life, tree of life, throne of glory, and the, but he is the carrier of the anointing. And we've talked about this before. What is the anointing? Is the eternal what? Presence, power, and truth of God Almighty. That is the anointing. Amen? And so the anointing allows access to the things that pertain to the kingdom. Everything is about kingdom business. We live according to the kingdom. Resources storehouses, all kinds of things we have access to. And one of the things that brings us access to these things is revelation. What brings us access? Revelation. Psalm happy days. He said, you shall receive what? Power. Power. Power to what? Resist. Power to what? Restrain. Resist the devil. You know, resistance is a sort of restraining. Psalm 39, verse 1. How many of y'all need power? Amen. That's why we gather together. But if you're not a worshiper, you can't get no power. Power comes through worship. Glory. Verse 1, let's speak it. I said I will what? Guard my ways lest I what? Sin with my tongue. I will guard my ways unless I what? Sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle. Holy Ghost muzzle. While the wicked are where? Before me. In other words, he said, I'm going to restrain myself from reacting. Because if I know I react, I sow in the flesh. And then it just opens more doors to the enemy. 
I'm going to restrain myself from speaking what I'm thinking. <laughs> Until my mind, my thoughts are exchanged for those that, of God. Amen. <laughs> Look at everybody still has terrible thoughts once in a while. If you're a person that walks around with beautiful thoughts all the time, you're a liar. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, man. The devil attacks you as you start worshiping. You start thinking about everything from wherever. Amen. <laughs> Verse 2. I, will, I was mute with silence, held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred up. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Lord, make me know my end, that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days of handbreadths, and my age is nothing before you. Certainly, every man at his best state is but vapor. Surely, every man walks about like a shadow. Surely, they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the reproach of the foolish. I was mute. I did not open my mouth because it was you who did it. Why? He gave him the power to restrain himself. <laughs> Remove your plague from me. I am consumed by the blow of your hand. When with rebukes you correct man for iniquity, you make his beauty melt away like a moth. Surely every man is what? Vapor. Wow. So he strained his desires to react until release came of response. In 1 Peter chapter 5. In verse 5, is everybody there? Let's speak it. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another, which means be humble. That's why he follows it up with be clothed with what? Humility. For God resists the proud. God does what? He resists the proud. So if he resists the proud, you know what he does? He restrains them. He restrains them. See, pride will bring a restraint on an individual. Why? Because God allows the enemy to come and restrain them. Does everybody understand that? Remember, the Lord wants us to be free of all things and maintain a restraint over our old man, old ways, so we can resist the devil. If you recall when Saul became real rebellious to God, what did the Lord allow? He allowed a distressing spirit to come. And what did that distressing spirit do? It bound Saul. It restrained him from doing what? The will of God. Does everybody understand that? He was no longer free. He was bound. So people don't realize that pride, in other words, I'm going to do it my way. This is how I feel. I'm not going to submit. That person's already bound. He's already restrained from doing the will of God and doesn't even know it. Pride is a killer. Personal reverence into a deadly end. It prevents people from getting in God's presence. It prevents them from being consistent. It prevents them from walking away from themselves. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the what? Humble. He gives a plan. That's God's plan. In other words, they're not, the humble are not restrained. They restrain the old man and the flesh so they can do the will of God because the flesh can't do the will of God. See, until you can restrain yourself, you cannot restrain anything else because you're actually in bondage. Amen? Amen? Verse 6, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting your cares upon him for he cares for you. Be sober, be what? Sober, which means what? Alert. 
Be vigilant. Be consistent. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may what? Devour or restrain. That's called bound. It says resist him. Steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Hallelujah. Is everybody okay? Listen. Restraining. Now, no, there's spirits of bondage. There's spirits of pride. There's spirits that we're fighting. Amen. And God has given us the ability to bind them. Amen. That's called restrain them. Go to uh, Mark's, or Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Jesus came to bring life and life what? Abundantly. That's why he said the path is narrow and difficult. Amen. Those are boundaries. He said not many enter in through it. Verse 13. It says when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? That's called relationship. There's a lot of people with long distance relationships. Not close. And what brings long distance relationship? People that are still touching unclean things, being rebellious, pride, whatever, brings a long distance. Verse 14. So they said, some say that the John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the what? The Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Did Peter get revelation? Yes. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. On what rock? On the anointing. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys... Of the kingdom of heaven. What are these keys? These are keys to restrain. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. There it is. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So we already have the keys to restrain as long as you're in a restrained state over your old man. Does everybody get it? Because God will not release authority to you unless you're under authority. The enemy will laugh at your face. You got no power. Hallelujah. Keys of divine restraints. Power to restrain not only yourself, but resist evil. Evil to bind and restrain it itself. In 1 Peter chapter 1. And the word tells us, come out from among them, be separate, and don't touch anything unclean. See, when people touch things unclean, the restraints of the old man have been loosed. And the restraint of the evil one comes and binds us. There's always an exchange made. First Peter chapter 1, is everybody there? Oh, happy days. Glory. And verse 2. First Peter chapter 1, verse... Oh, hallelujah. Verse 3, I'm sorry. Let's speak it together. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. That's active. Everyone say active. 
When it says living, it means active. How many of y'all know it's our responsibility to keep things active? You know, you got to keep your faith active. Everything must be active. One of the things the enemy wants to do is if he can get you to a place of exchanging restraints, no longer are we active. A person bound isn't active, are they? Oh, yes. Blessed be the Lord God, our Father, Lord Jesus, who according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are what? So who are kept by what? Power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you, greatly, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believe in you rejoice with joy inexpressibly and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Wow. So we see here that we are in a time right now where there is going to be trials and tribulations. But remember, those should be strengthening the restraints. They should not be loosening your restraints. They should be strengthening your restraints. Just like if you're going somewhere and you, you know, you're, you're driving on a terrible bumpy road, you might want to tighten your safety belt, you know. Why? So you don't fly all over the place. But in that, we are tightening. God is tightening our restraints because of what's going on right now, because of so much influence and so demonic corruption that's going on. Peter first. Yeah, let's go to Second Peter. Hallelujah. Uh, chapter one, verse two. Let's go there. Chapter one, verse two. What's it say? Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power. Everyone say divine power. Of God, of Jesus our Lord, and has, has given us to what? All things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in a world through what? Through lust. Divine power is anointing, the, the, anoint, the anointing. The anointing is what assists in your restraining. Because without power, you can't restrain the old man. Amen? And how do we continue to increase the anointing? Worship. 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 People who can't worship have no power. People who are not consistent in worship have no power. They still rely on knowledge. And knowledge does not outpower the enemy. Amen? Hallelujah. So we see here we need divine power, which is the anointing to restrain. And we get also an expansion of things through the knowledge of God so that we can correctly interpret what he's saying to us. In this revelation that we get, one of the things about revelation brings us reality. Not only does it, when reality comes, 
it enlightens identity. I'm going to say that again. When, when, so when revelation comes and reality comes, it enlightens identity, who I am. The most tormenting thing an individual can go through is knowing who they are and not being able to fulfill who they are. I know I'm this, but I can't get there. Why can't you get there? Because bound, restrained by the enemy until those restraints are removed. 1 John chapter 2. How many of y'all know emotional restraints can really keep you bound? That's why the enemy loves to break a heart. He lists to get people betray. You know, when a person betrays another person, that's, a, that's a effective. Amen? That has to be healed. So you can't hold on to bitterness yourself if you've been betrayed. And then when you finally get to the reality that you betrayed someone, it's hurting to you then. So the enemy just nails both individuals, the one who betrayed and the one who got betrayed. So both of them are now bound by the enemy until it is released. Amen? That's where forgiveness is important. Why? Because that's an emotional bondage. That's why people run to the things they shouldn't run to, to look for freedom, and it just increases the bondage. You know, people run to drugs, alcohol, and all the other pornography and anything else, and it's just another form of bondage, and they don't even realize it. They're actually looking for freedom and can't get there. Free me from this. That's where you got to dive in God's presence, no matter what. And don't just sit there. You worship. <laughs> Why? You're going to activate your worship. Amen? Hallelujah. First John chapter 2 and verse 15. Hallelujah. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Is everybody there? For all that is in the world, the what? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the, of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Little children, it's the last hour that you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. And if you don't know what the last hour is, you're in trouble. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Why did they get moved out? Restraints. No restraints over the old, and they got bound and restrained. It's like when a dog gets a collar on them with a chain, and they get pulled. See, the word dog means demonized individual. So in this, an individual has now lost the restraints of the old and the flesh, and now been taken captive by the enemy, and now he's pulled around like a dog. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He just talked about three categories of demonic influence. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and what? Pride. Well, what did they do? They all bring bondage, don't they? Every single one. He said, but verse 20, but you have a what? An anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. So one of the things the enemy wants to do, you know, people don't realize that the anointing is a part of cooperation. The eternal presence, power, and truth of God Almighty is a power that you and I must be connected to all the time. And you sense a disconnect and drift. And, and so in this, as you and I are maintaining that connection through fellowship, through worship, through submission, through communication with God's voice, in every area of our life, we maintain that anointing, that presence, 
that maintains the restraints because you know what happens? There's something that occurs to us. We hate evil. When a person begins to compromise evil, that means restraints have already been broke. 1 Samuel chapter 3. First Samuel chapter three. Hallelujah. Is everybody there? Starting in at verse one. Now there was a woman who offered her son to the Lord, his name was Samuel. So Eli was known as the prophet at the time. And it says, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days because there was no widespread revelation. So the word was rare. The word was rare. Amen. So it, in this is something powerful because it says here, And the word of the Lord was rare. In those days, and there was no widespread revelation because there was lack of communication. Now, at that time, you had the tabernacle, amen, and you had the, the ark was, Eli was the high priest and the prophet at the time, and he was in charge of keeping everything in order. He was in charge of making sure that the ark was taken care of, the holy place, the most holy place, and the, all the tabernacle was taken care of. So here this woman comes to offer her son, so he's sleeping near the ark. Does everybody understand it? He's sleeping in the, near, in the presence of God. Obviously, Eli was now a distance. In this it says, and it came to pass that time, at, at that time while Eli was lying down in his place and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see and before the lamp of God went out where? Into the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was and while Samuel was lying down. So Samuel was lying closer to the ark that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered and said, here I am. And so he ran to Eli. And he said, here I am, for you called me. And, and he said, I did not call you. Lay down again. And he went and laid down. And then the Lord yet called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And he answered and said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. So one was hearing the voice of God and one wasn't. One was closer to the presence of God and one wasn't. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Now, check this out. He didn't know the Lord yet. Nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. So he didn't know nothing. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you bonehead. No. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> For you did call me, he's saying. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. So Eli finally awakened to that. It must be God. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lay down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went, lay down in his place. Now, did God know what Eli told Samuel? Yeah. Now watch what happened. Now the Lord came. The Lord did what? Now he came. Why? Because he already knew what Samuel was told by Eli. So he was expecting. So the Lord went to go now meet him. Now the Lord came and stood and called as the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. Because he knew he was going to say that, didn't he? 
And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I do something in Israel, in which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. Now, did Samuel know anything about what God had said to Eli? No. Now, he didn't reveal everything. Amen. He just said, I'm going to. I already warned Eli what's what. Now he's going to tell him something. He says, for I have told him that I will judge this his house forever for the iniquity which he knows. He, he what? He knows. So Eli knows what's going on, even though he's not participating in what's going on. But because of his position, he is accountable for what's going on. Because his sons have made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. So Eli did not restrain his sons from committing fornication, for lying, for cheating. Does everybody understand that? And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He answered, here I am. And he said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God so told, uh, do, God do so to you. And more also, if you hide anything from me of all the things that he has said to you. And Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Now, why not Samuel just submit? Or Eli just submit and say, look it, and get his sons. Because he was fearful of his sons. He feared man more than he did God. Now, Eli was bound. So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Bathsheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord did what? Appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Let me tell you, every true prophet of the nation is visited by the Lord in multiple visitations. This is not just a gift of prophecy by the gifts of the Spirit. These are prophets that are positioned in prophets. They are an office of a prophet. They are visited by the Lord. If they haven't been visited by the Lord, they're not true prophets. Does everybody get this? Hallelujah. So in this, we know what happened later. Israel got attacked. They took the Ark of the Covenant, and Eli fell over and broke his neck. And Israel went into captivity. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. Why? No revelation because of disobedience. No restraints of evil. Until Samuel lay near the ark in the presence of God and things changed around. Amen? Judges 16. Divine restraints. Judges 16. Oh, happy days. Verse 13. Now there was a man named Samson who was born, brought up. He was a Nazarite. He was sanctified unto the Lord. His purpose was to go and set Israel free from the Palestines. Or what we call the Philistines. <laughs> In verse 13, let's speak it together. Delilah, one of his hooker associates. said to Samson, 
Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of a loom, so she wove it tightly with the batten of the womb and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the batten and web from the loom. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. Let me tell you, gentlemen, if a woman is like that with you, do not stay with her. It's real simple. Run. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, you got to understand something that the powers of darkness knew that Samson had the anointing to restrain. Amen. In fact, every time they tried to restrain him with ropes, he broke them off. Why? Because the anointing breaks off restraints of the enemy. But the moment he fell into the area to reveal and break covenant what kept his strength, he lost the anointing. People don't realize that there are certain things they break covenant with God with, and the anointing instantly is removed. Then it has to be regained renewed. There's a process of restoring an individual back to the anointing. So a person first gets restored to salvation, to the presence of God, and then to the Word of God and covenant, and then back to the anointing. And it is a process. Amen? Is everybody okay? It says here, then, um, what happened is, it came to pass in verse 16, when she pastored him daily with her words, impressed him so that his soul was vexed to death, that he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Do you realize that you're not like another person? You're, you're no longer, I want to say you're no longer human. See, because there's an area where we have a human part of us, but we are eternal. We're no longer human. We don't go according to the human nature, the, 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 the fallen nature. We are of a divine nature. We no longer live from the past. We live from the future. You are more than who you think you are. And that's what God is trying to bring us to a place of so that our mind is aligned of who we are in spirit. Amen? Think about this. Well, it says we're blessed with every spiritual blessing, seated in heavenly places. We're joint heir of Christ. Uh, we're the righteousness of God. Didn't say you felt like it. That's what defeats people. I didn't feel like that. In verse 18, when Deliah saw that he had told her all of his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, come on up once more. For he has told me all of his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. Then she lured him to sleep on her knees and called for the men and had him shave off his seven lockets of his head. And she began to torment him. Nice love. And did what? And his strength left him. The anointing left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before, as all the other times, and I'll shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. See, people don't realize when the Lord departs from them. They just continue on thinking everything's okay and it, it ain't happening. Then the Philistines took him and poked out or put out his eyes. And brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in prison. Wow. Breaking covenant. See, you're breaking covenant with the anointing. You're breaking covenant with what? The anointing. The power, truth, and presence of God Almighty. Breaking covenant by what? 
touching something unclean. And then again, there's the process of restoring. Breaking the covenant with the anointing is a result of no revelation. Disorder. And when that anointing is broke, there's no power to restrain yourself. And you become restrained and bound. And Matthew 10, 34. Matthew 10, 34. Glory. So Jesus already gave us the keys to restrain, didn't he? Amen? That's why we got to be first strikers. The moment you stop first striking, you'll be struck. Matthew 10, 34, is everybody there? Do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mo her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will what? Will find it. Very powerful. Okay, so in this, what did he say? I did not come to bring peace. I came to bring a what? Sword. Remember, the keys are to bind. The sword is to loose. So the sword is to cut loose those who have been taken captive. It's to cut loose the restraints that are on you. Amen? So that you can get repositioned again and be reestablished to the anointing. So the sword cuts loose the bondages. In Hebrews 4, but the sword must be backed by the anointing. Amen? If it's not backed by the anointing, it ain't cutting nothing. It nothing becomes a seed. That's why repentance is essential. Remember, the blood always goes before the spirit. Hebrews 4.12. Glory. Is everybody there? For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give a account for. So the word of God is the sword to cut loose restraints backed by the anointing and the keys. And again, the keys are to restrain the evil. Evil entities of influence. How many of you know fear is an evil entity? You know, people don't realize that sickness can bring a person into bondage. It's a restrainer. People that are on certain medications, worldly music, videos, and so forth, or cursed items, or they bring people into bondage. That's why the Lord keeps telling us, don't touch anything unclean. Don't agree with something unclean. You know, the world has a standard of ways of life, but we're not of the world of life anymore. We're eternal. We are part of the eternal life, and we must live according to the eternal ways and rules. Or we're bound by restraints all over again. Hosea 4. Hosea 4. Divine restraints. Is everybody there in verse 1? Hosea 4, verse 1. 
Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. Wow, there's no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. In other words, there's no revelation. By swearing and lying. Why? Because sin always breaks the covenant with the anointing. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraints with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Therefore, the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste away. With the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, even the fish of the sea will be taken away. Now let no man contend or rebuke another, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. Therefore, you shall stumble in the day. The prophet also shall stumble with you in the night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected this knowledge, I will also reject you from being a priest for me. That's someone close to the Lord. And because you have forgotten the law of the word of God, I will also forget your children. That's a curse that goes down to your family line. Amen. It says, the more they increase, the more they sin against me. I will change their glory into shame. I will eat up the sin of my, they eat up the sin of my people. They set their heart on their own iniquity. And it shall be like, it shall be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their deeds. For they shall eat but not have enough. They shall commit holotry but not increase. Because they have ceased obeying the Lord. Wow. And Galatians 3. And then one more scripture. Divine restraints. Oh, happy days. In verse 1, Galatians 3, verse 1, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has what? Bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? What happened? They touched and agreed with something. They've been bewitched. They've been deceived. They've now exchanged walking in the Spirit for the wisdom of man. They exchanged the power of God for the wisdom of man. They took the counsel of the world. Man, I can't tell you how many calls I get about counsel of the world. My family this, my family that, well, where, 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 what's going on? Well, they're, they're in counsel. Well, who count, s s counsels of the world? Well, man, you're a Christian. What are you doing with counsel of the world? That's all they do is medicate you and put you in more bondage. And that's, my second question is, is, are they on medication? Yes. What the heck? Anyways, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, and now you are being made perfect by the flesh? Have you so suffered many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for Righteousness. Therefore, know that only those who are of the faith are sons of Abraham. Now, of the faith means you're connected. Amen? You're connected to the future. You're connected. Because then what does God do? He checks our genuineness of our faith. He wants to know if we're really connected. Everyone goes through stuff. But the word go through. That's where you know all things are going to work to good. Amen? Oh, Galatians 6, and we'll close here. What happened by being witches? They compromised their identity, rejecting the restraint 
of deception, not rejecting the restraint of deception. And Galatians chapter 6. Oh, happy days. Let's speak it together. Do not be what? Deceived. Satan's greatest weapon is, and that's not changing, it's never going to change. <laughs> His purpose is to deceive us and get us to exchange restraints. Restraining of the old for his restraints. God is not mocked for whatever man sows, he's going to reap. Oh, yeah. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Remember, nobody gets away without reaping. Nobody. Well, no matter what it's done, no matter, I don't care, of course, the longer you take to repent. Amen? And that means turn away from it, the more you're going to reap. But if your heart is truly set in true repentance, God is going to use that reaping time to train you. What? In the process of reconnecting you back to the anointing. Amen? Because he loves us. But it's an opportunity for him to train us. And because you don't want to walk away from the potter's wheel. <laughs> And for he who sows to the Spirit reaps everlasting life. And let us not grow what? Weary. Don't get compromised. Don't give up. Stand strong. Keep going forward. Again, if you get run over, get, get up. Don't grow weary while doing good. For in due season, you will reap if you do not what? If you don't what? If you don't quit. Two hundred people would just quit. That's it. I give up. I mean, there's some things you need to give up. Like yourself. That's a wonderful thing to give up. Give up all the alcohol, all the pornography. Give it all up. And walk away from it. And get reconnected again. It's a terrible life to live. It's terrible. It's tormenting. Amen? We don't want it. And we certainly don't want the restraints of the enemy. I'd rather carry the divine, straits of God, divine restraints of God than the enemy. Amen? That's where freedom is. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. We ask that you prepare our hearts for communion. And as we take communion today, Lord, we ask that you will break every restraint off of everyone in this room of bondage. In Jesus' name. <laughs>